a preemptive artillery bombardment was designed to destroy the German defences. But the German machine gunners took shelter in deep bunkers, then moved rapidly into position. And by this stage of the war, they had developed highly effective machine gun tactics. Bob Podesta demonstrates why the placement of guns is a vital tactical decision. While the enemy regroups, the machine gun team moves to an alternative firing point, on the flank. The difference is immediately apparent. The balloons line up 50 deep behind each other, creating a far greater concentration of targets to hit. Now the true power of the machine gun is unleashed. The result is carnage. Podesta is even able to shoot several balloons with a single bullet. This time round, 250 bullets make 240 kills. When a machine gun sights the enemy from the flank, there's no escape. You've got a, a much easier target because it looks as if the, um, the enemy is, is grouped together that much closer. And uh, you can probably take out ten times more of them than uh, you would do if they were coming from the front. In World War I, the Germans could protect a section of trench with just two machine guns on the flanks. Each gunner swept a predetermined arc as close as he dared to his own lines. When the enemy attacked, the gunners did not open fire straight away. They waited until the attackers entered the killing zone. The interlocking arcs of fire created an impenetrable wall of lead. The British infantry were utterly decimated by machine gun fire from the flanks. The first day of the Battle of the Somme was the greatest loss of life in British military history. All down the line, the attackers were met by a maelstrom of interlocking fire from pairs of German machine guns. 20,000 men were lost. Attacking enemy machine guns was a suicide mission and the world war degenerated into bloody stalemate. Final machine gun casualties on all sides have been estimated at 5.5 million. In the words of historian Sir Basil Liddell Hart, statesmen found themselves puppets in the grip of Hiram Maxim, who had paralyzed the power of attack. All efforts to break the defensive grip of the machine gun were in vain. The heavy machine guns of World War I were so effective that the basic design is still in use today. The US Marines M2 dates back to 1921, but the recoil of the barrel betrays even earlier roots in Hiram Maxim's invention. At seven rounds per second, the heavy caliber bullets can penetrate brick walls. For the enemy, a mile and a half away, there's no hiding place. But this battle is no World War I stalemate. The infantry take over and move on the enemy trench. To stay mobile, the attacking Marines must coordinate, maintaining continuous fire to keep enemy heads down. To do this, they need light and portable machine guns, enabling each Marine to fire, then move. After the static trench warfare of World War I, weapons like these opened a new chapter in the story of the machine gun. As an ordnance officer in World War I, US Colonel John T. Thompson dreamed of a new weapon that could be used to infiltrate trenches and kill the occupants. 
After the war, he set out to design a lightweight, fully portable machine gun that attacking troops could fire on the move. Thompson realized that existing machine guns had too many heavy components. These would all have to go. In his new design, the only heavy moving part was the bolt. In each cycle, the bolt simply flipped out the old cartridge while a spring-loaded magazine loaded the new one. This was the first sub-machine gun, less than a quarter of the weight of existing weapons like the Maxim gun. Thompson called it the trench broom, a weapon to sweep away the static warfare of the past. Everyone else called it the Tommy gun. The distinctive circular magazine carrying up to a hundred rounds could be emptied in less than seven seconds. But the war was over and the US Army didn't need such a newfangled weapon. Someone else did. Gangsters. 1920s mobsters like Al Capone were quick to spot the potential of a weapon that could wipe out their enemies fast. The Tommy gun became an icon of death and destruction, the stuff of bloodthirsty newspaper stories and Hollywood movies. It was the must-have accessory for any gangster on the make, and the police were soon forced to get Tommy guns of their own. But the first ever mob hit with a Tommy gun didn't quite go to plan. Spike O'Donnell ran a major bootlegging operation on the south side of Chicago. On September the 25th, 1925, mob rival Frank McElain set out to kill him, armed with a Tommy gun and an unknown quantity of ammunition. What happened next gave them both the shock of their lives. McElaine missed with every single shot. But O'Donnell had seen enough. The Tommy gun was enough to make him quit the gangster business for good. So why did the hit go wrong? Former Special Forces machine gunner Bob Podesta explains. The problem with the Thompson okay, is that when you fire it, especially the automatic, the weapon tends to rise okay, and pull away slightly to the right. Okay, the way to remedy this is by putting a little bit of body pressure against the weapon. Okay, and also I've got another little gizmo that will also help remedy that. Later model Tommy guns were fitted with a so-called cuts compensator. Its invention might have led to a very different ending for Spike O'Donnell. The compensator diverts some of the blast upwards, forcing the muzzle down. The Tommy gun became a highly effective close-range killer. And even if a few innocent bystanders were caught in the crossfire, a spray of bullets was just what the bad guys wanted. But the good guys wanted more precision. So Thompson gave his weapon a semi-automatic option where it fires and reloads just once for each squeeze of the trigger. And that's how the police use a new generation of submachine guns today. <laughs> this is a highly realistic training scenario for the police department SWAT team in Palm Springs, California. Their weapon of choice is the Heckler & Koch MP5 a modern descendant of the Tommy gun that can empty its 30-round magazine in just two and a half seconds. 
But that's only a last resort if officers are surrounded 